Joining me is a man who I think is Britain's sharpest political commentator, Brendan O'Neill of Spiked Online. Please read him. Brendan, it's wonderful to catch up with you again this year. Prince Andrew never did seem that mad to cooperate with the police. Now, why do you think that would be? Well, you know, I think that the, the latest revelation that there has been zero cooperation is, is really bad for Andrew. I think it looks really bad. It sounds really bad. It's, it sounds like he's got something to hide. That's what lots of people here in the UK are thinking, and I'm sure around the world as well. And, it, you know, the problem is that it comes off as if he thinks he's above the law. There's an arrogant tone to this kind of... It's very dismissive, very dismissive of a, a, a pretty serious investigation in, in terms of his relations with Epstein and various uh, young women. You know, at the time that um, Andrew did his disastrous Newsnight interview in which he made a complete fool of himself, I argued that, you know... He, even Prince Andrew shouldn't be subjected to trial by media. He should have a fair trial. These accusations should be tested in a court of law. And yet Andrew himself is now failing to um, cooperate with that kind of investigation, which just makes even someone like me who thinks everyone should have a fair trial, makes me, it gets my back up. So I think he's making a mistake. I think he needs to talk to law enforcement and sort this stuff out. Look, I agree with everything you just said. I, I hate trial by media too, but the point is there is not going to be a trial. He's not presenting the uh, other case in a way that we can answer the allegations against him. So, given that, look, maybe he is above the law, Brendan. I don't know. How bad do you think this could get for him? Uh, he's not going to be yanked out of uh, Buckingham Palace by, uh, you know, uh, some sort of uh, writ or anything like that, is he? What, what, what's, what do you think? How, how's this going to end? But that, that's the million dollar question. I mean, it is quite unpredictable at the moment. It's quite unprecedented. So we're, we're all watching it with our mouths open here. Um, and, you know, all of today's British newspapers have got Andrew on the front cover. The Sun has got a brilliant front cover which says, um, missing person Prince Andrew, have you seen this man? <laughs> uh, and then, you know, distinguishing features. It's, uh, distinguishing features are he doesn't sweat, he likes pizza, and he's unemployed. So people are really going for Andrew. And I think justify as well because this really is um, rubbishing the royals reputation you know I, I'm a, Repu a Republican by nature I don't really believe in the monarchy but even I find myself feeling very sorry for the Queen at the moment because she has all yes. these um, princes and and ha uh, hangers-on who are making a complete show off the royal family and, and, and complete show of the House of Windsor. And I feel sorry for her having to manage so many crises at a rather late stage in her life. So what will happen next? We, we know that Andrew has already been retired from royal life. We know that he no longer does public duties. Will it go further? Will the Queen force him to talk to law enforcement? That's definitely a possibility. Uh, Brendan, uh, I think you raise a really interesting point here. Whether this is not just a pattern of decay in the royal family, like you've had the Queen setting this amazing example of you know duty service discretion honor all that kind of stuff um, and i wonder and, and then you've got this a terrible tail off and i'm just wondering whether that's in fact reflecting a societal decay in all those things as well i mean you know we just had mm. prince harry giving a speech last week that i played some of effectively confirming he was sacked from his royal duties that he wanted to do part time and, and and get paid for other stuff on, on you know on the side this is just shocking it's it's really shocking and i think you're absolutely right the the, the divide between harry and meghan on one side and the queen on the other really does speak to an important social cultural divide in the 21st century you know the queen represents those old values of duty and loyalty and, and self-negation and and you know not letting it all hang out keeping your opinions and your emotions to yourself and just doing your duty to your nation and to your people whereas harry and meghan represent that kind of very narcissistic woke generation who are constantly online who are who want to be they effectively want to be a global brand they want to globe trot around the world lecturing to the rest of us about how to be woke how to shrink our carbon footprint and so on and they play the victim card which is so typical of that kind of millennial generation you know the the most mad idea we have in this country at the moment is that this princess the, the duchess of sussex uh, meghan markle the idea that she is oppressed that she's been oppressed by the racist media she's been oppressed by the british people completely untrue there's not a sliver of evidence that the coverage of Meghan Markle has been driven by racism. And yet, if you ask for evidence, if you ask for proof, 
they call you racist even for asking that question. So I think the way in which Harry and Meghan have embraced that kind of very woke agenda, very victim-driven agenda, and the mental health agenda and all those things speaks to a new royal family which is drifting away down some very problematic millennial trends. Well, on that point, and I did mention uh, Prince Charles earlier, the next king, he seems to me, again, to have lost the discipline of his mother. He's actually behaving more now like a politician than a royal, making speeches on global warming. Last week, he even posing with global warming prophet Greta Thunberg, who's a supporter of groups like Antifa and all that. Is this really his role? No, absolutely not. And um, people like me, Republicans, and also monarchists as well, in fact, are very worried about the increasingly political role that Charles has been playing for a few years now. We know that he writes letters to politicians. We know that he's obsessed with climate change in a way that is quite hysterical and, and over the top. Um, he's, he sticks his nose into political affairs and public affairs rather too much. And, you know, let's remember, we fought a civil war in this country and had a revolution in this country in, in the 1640s and the 1680s to, to get the royals out of political life and to make them this kind of decorative constitutional family. And I, I'm very worried that when the Queen moves on, when the Queen passes away, um, Charles will turn the monarchy back into an interfering political institution. And that will make it incredibly unpopular. I think once the Queen's reign is over, the future of the royal family will be called into question precisely because of the behaviour of people like Charles and also Harry and Meghan too. Well, I think uh, Charles should learn a lesson from previous kings called Charles who thought they should uh, meddle more yes. with po politics than they should. Um, do you think he risks coming over as a bit of a climate hysteric? I want to show you something. Here he is last week saying we had to act now on global warming. Here he is. We simply cannot waste any more time. The time to act is now. But Brendan, I'm surprised he's still asking us to act now when this same bloke 11 years ago said then that we had just seven years left, and so that's gone up four years ago, seven years left to save ourselves. Here he is in 2009. The grim reality is that our planet has reached a point of crisis and we have only seven years before we lose the levers of control. Now, how, what do you make of that? We had just seven years left to do something 11 years ago, but Charles is still there telling us to act now. <laughs> I mean, it is so typical of, of what you correctly describe as, as the climate hysterics of, of which Charles is now one. I mean, they've been predicting the end of days for a very long time. They keep telling us we've got 10 years left, 5 years left, 12 years left, and time never runs out because they are exaggerating. They are driving the politics of fear. They, they have become hysterical. You know, environmentalism more broadly has become an increasingly hysterical, end of the world, almost fundamentalist cult, which is constantly banging on about, uh, about the sinful nature of humankind and the need for us to punish ourselves for having destroyed the planet. It's a very backward, reactionary, strange world view. And I think the Donald Trump uh, uh, was right at Davos when he said that these people come off like prophets of doom. They are constantly predicting the end of the world, but as Trump pointed out, they are constantly wrong. They were wrong about an overpopulation crisis, they were wrong about global cooling, they were wrong about a new ice age, and my prediction is that they will be wrong that we only have a few years left to save the planet. I think we've got to stop listening to these prophets of doom, including Charles, and have a much more rational, reasoned discussion about the problems facing humanity. Yeah, but this particular problem with him is that he is a royal. He should not be making himself mm -hmm. a figure of fun, increasingly like uh, his um, brother. Brendan O'Neill, thank you so much for coming on the show again. Look forward to speaking to you later thank in the you. year. Um, and I urge viewers to catch Brendan O'Neill on Spiked Online. Great stuff there. Thanks, Brendan.